1964, Granada Television brought together a group of seven-year-olds and has filmed them every seven years. I think it's the most brilliant concept because it's so simple. It's such an optimistic series. That's why it's one of the greatest series ever made. Seven Up is quietly extraordinary. I read the Financial Times. I'm going to work in Woolworths. My heart's desire is to see my daddy. And the latest instalment of their story is about to hit our screens. For over half a century, we've watched their lives unfold. This year, we'll see them reach 63. And to celebrate, famous fans are looking back at this extraordinary series. I remember this. Is this important as a fight? Yes. He's like something out of Oliver. Do you have a girlfriend? I don't want to answer that. Quite right, son. They'll share their own memories of growing up. 17 acres of forest have grown since then. And why the 7-Up series means so much to them. To see young children with visions and ideas and then actually being able to see whether they materialise or not. The older they get, the more we just connect to the sweep of what it is to be a human being. If you're interested in people and how people's lives unfold, how could you not be drawn to this show? Most telly is just telly, isn't it? You turn it on, you watch it, you turn it off. Just occasionally something comes on the screen which seems to sum up something about all of us. World in Action enters the struggling, changing world of the seven-year-old. On May the 5th, 1964, this current affairs show changed TV history. We brought these children together because we wanted a glimpse of England in the year 2000. The film put a famous saying under the microscope. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. Allegedly, Aristotle said, give me a child until he is seven, and I'll show you the man. And then I think the Jesuits took that on as their mantra. Great tragedy or events can hobble or hiccup in your life, but I think essentially who you are is, that's pretty much set. And that's what the programme set out to explore. How much does our social class define our future? They're like any other children, except that they come from startlingly different backgrounds. The cast of children included Cheeky Tony, Yes. <laughs> the artful Dodger Tony. The three London girls. I think I know the one that he liked best, and that's her. The Bernardo boys, Simon and Paul. What does university mean? The optimistic Liverpudlian Neil. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut, but if I can't be an astronaut, I think I'll be a coach driver. And the boys from the prep school. I read the Financial Times. I read Observer and the Times. I usually look at the headlines and then read about... What? About it. About it. <laughs> this is a very broad demographic. Some of them are reading the Financial Times, whilst the others, you know, are reading the Beano. This is no ordinary outing at the zoo. It's a very special occasion. We've brought these children together for the very first time. All of those children look like they're dressed like 60-year-olds or something. Look at those They hadn't really invented children yet, had they? <laughs> Oi! You could see two completely different worlds. Posh kids, poor kids. I don't think any other country is divided by class the way that Britain is. When I get married, I'd like to have two oh. children. When I get married, I don't want to have any children because they are always doing naughty things. There's a lot of times you, you find yourself filling up at these innocent, beautiful voices. What would you do if you had lots of money about, um, me? Two pounds. Me? Anything. I would help the poor. Yeah, because the, the poor, if you don't help them, they're sort of dying soon, wouldn't they? 
Yeah, they would. You're right. They're grabbing little um, sound bites of, of things they've heard their parents say. Once Kathleen Tedford said she was good, she she loved me, and I'm going to marry many, marry her when I grow up. They're somehow unaware. They're not performing. Do you like to get married, uh, Paul? Tell me why not. I don't like um. Say you had a wife. They they say you had to eat what they Paul is you. amazing. And and say. I don't like greens, well, I don't. <laughs> and so she said, you have to eat what, what you get, give. So I, I don't like greens, so she gives me greens. And, that, and that's it. <laughs> that's definitely going to work. If your wife forces greens on you. <laughs> the more privileged kids like Susie, Bruce and Andrew were filmed at their private schools. When I leave this school, I go to a broad stair, St. Peter's Court. Then after that, I'm going to Charter House. And after that, Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Gosh, I mean, to have it all mapped out like that. It's a bit like a, a railway track. You know, you go to a good prep school, you go to a good public school, you get to a good university. At seven, the boys are singing Waltzing Matilda in Latin. <laughs> Did I sing Waltzing Matilda in Latin? No. I think it's wonderful, absolutely marvellous. My heart warms to see these kids singing Waltzing Matilda in Latin. Meanwhile, in the East End, Tony's education was less waltzing and more fighting. And watching Tony's school days brings back memories for a fellow East Ender. You didn't see school as a springboard to university and then possibly a career. It was this thing that you did because you sort of had to. Tony, do you hear as well? But the problem was we weren't really listening and we didn't really believe it. Come with your work in front. I'm not saying my school was bad. Tony! But do you want to know the alumni from my school? Me, John H. Stracy the boxer, Ronnie and Reggie Cray, and the three girls who ran off to be jihadi brides. There you go. <laughs> oh, my God. So what were the lives of our other celebrity fans like at seven? 17 acres of forehead have grown since then. I feel the same. In the early 60s, the seven-year-old Richard E. Grant was living in Swaziland. My parents were still married, and I just started making shoebox theatres with little lollipop sticks with cut-out magazine figures stuck on them and painted scenery and a bedside lamp over the top. And also wanted to be an astronaut. Seven class clown, definitely. We did a little show in our village hall and I did a kind of hybrid of Tommy Cooper and Frank Spencer. Because my Frank Spencer impression was better than my Tommy Cooper impression, I did Frank Spencer getting magic wrong. That little fella is, is in here somewhere. Um, but just with a lot of foliage now. Well, it's very particular for me at seven because I lived for three years not in Wales, so I went to live in the Liverpool area between five and eight in Wallasey and Birkenhead. I was at the height of my obsession with football at that point. Seven years old, Kevin Keegan played with the number seven on his back for Liverpool. He was my hero. Liverpool was my team. I used to go and watch them play. Keegan's goal is almost inevitable. And I realised, when I was seven, I spoke with a Scouse accent. I was like, all right, all right. And uh, so, you know, that was very specific. For three years, I sounded like that. I was very cheeky, very cheeky seven. And having that Liverpool accent as well just added to that cheekiness. In fact, I, was, I had such a strong accent that my parents had to send me to elocution lessons because they couldn't understand anything I said. Seven is a crucial age. I'd say my real strongest memories sort of begin around there. In the 1980s, a young Ben Bailey Smith was living in North London, being bitten by the acting bug. I tap into that seven-year-old in terms of like spirit and energy for performance and creativity more than any other part of myself. 
I'm standing on the stage at what was the Tricycle Theatre in Kilburn High Road, which was as a kid where I used to come for uh, drama workshops. Really enjoyed it looking back. I don't think it can be underestimated the influence this place had in just sort of kick-starting something in me that never, I mean, to this day, it's just, it's just never really left me. Yeah, that seven-year-old is everything. At seven, my home life was very, very happy. This was pre-troubles in Northern Ireland. My father was a carpet fitter and he had a carpet van called the Magic Carpet. It was in days before there were no seat belts, there were no back seats in it. We jumped into the back of the car and we were protected by massive rolls of carpet or felt. I'd say for me, seven was when I was became a wheelchair user and I stopped walking. I was born with spina bifida, could never walk very well. But just as I grew, my spine collapsed and my cord became severed, so I stopped walking. And I'm hugely grateful to my parents and my head teacher, Mr. Dewey Thomas, who basically kept me in main, mainstream state school. Because actually, without that, I wouldn't have been an athlete, wouldn't have got an education, wouldn't have gone to university, wouldn't have ended up in politics. And that, for me, I think is, is, is a really important reminder that my life could have radically changed at, at seven years old. When I was seven, I was very lucky because I was in a very, very working class area in Manchester and my mum lied and she pretended that I lived somewhere else. So I went to a school that was slightly, I suppose, out of my class in a way. It wasn't particularly posh school, it was still like in a working class area in Stockport, but it was different to the one where I was living. And because I could sing and my brother could sing, we got in the choir. Sally's school was called St Winifred's, and in 1980, when she was seven, the choir released a single which became an unlikely chart topper. Grandma, we love you. Interestingly, I can see myself on television at seven. I knew what I looked like, I knew what I moved like, which it must be amazing for the adults in this to see themselves as a child, and I, I got to do that. Grandma, Sally's happy memories of childhood are in sharp contrast to the lives of some of the children filmed in 1964. This dormitory is in a children's home, supported by charity. This is Paul and Simon. I had one dream when all the world was on top of me and everything flew up in the air. It all landed on my head. Oh. At seven, Bruce was at a pre-preparatory boarding school. At seven. 14, St Paul's School in London. My heart's desire is to see my daddy, who's 6,000 miles away. He just misses his dad, do you know what I mean? At the age of seven, I was sent away to boarding school. Linoleum floors, cold bath every morning, strict rules, strict discipline. I was wrenched from a warm and friendly, loving thing into quite a stark reality of what life is with its disciplines and teaching. But there was caning. Prefects could cane, boys could cane other boys when I started. Well, let's turn. I remember one boy, he was caned in a way that when he came out, there were wheels standing up on his backside and some of them were cut. Gosh. Yeah, that wasn't good. Come in. Going to boarding school at a very early age, for me, it's utterly barbaric. I don't ever remember any other time as being so pain-filled as that was, absolutely, abjectly miserable. That feeling of being abandoned is very pervasive and very strong. And when you feel in a state of self-doubt, which I very often am, that is what that feeling goes back to. Those formative years, when you see those children and you see a reflection of yourself in that, it is very powerful. And I, it does mark your life, I think. And if being seven can be tough, the highs and lows of teenage life are a roller coaster. The girls loved me because I was Joseph. I thought, aye, aye. I wish sometimes I could go back to my 14 year old self and says, Look, kid, no one's looking at you. In 1970, Britain was a rapidly changing country. Edward Heath's Conservatives had gained power. 
the Beatles were splitting up and a series of strikes led to disruption and power cuts. On a more positive note, Michael Apted, a researcher from the original 7-Up film, paid the children a second visit. These children are now 14, halfway between childhood and manhood. This is our interim report. He's been dropping in every seven years ever since, always finding time, even after his career as a Hollywood movie director had taken off. I was told that this television show that I worked on in the States called Masters of Sex was getting a new director. Everybody was very excited. It was Michael Apted. Michael has never been one for self-promotion, but uh, how could he not be so, so proud of this? The great thing about Apted is he's built a relationship up with all these people over the years, and he's clearly befriended them, and so he can be quite intimate with them. How do you think you've changed since you were seven? Well, I mean, one grows so slowly that one never notices. Have you got any boyfriends? <laughs> um, uh... <laughs> That's pose normally. In the second Up documentary, the kids were now 14, a tricky age for anybody, whatever the decade. Have you got any boyfriends, Susan? the cruelty of putting cameras on anybody that age. <laughs> it's just, ugh. Have you got a girlfriend? Nope. Would you like to have a girlfriend? Nope. 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 Um. Their expressions just say it all, don't they? What do you think about making this program? I just think it's just ridiculous. I don't see any point in doing it. I can empathize with that. I can remember being that age. Blech. Yes, tell us about your adolescence. Oh, God, it's <laughs> still going on. <laughs> 14 is a kind of an excruciation. I remember my, my nose grew out of proportion. I had freckles, pimples, you know, everything. My voice was doing that. So, yeah, I think that is the most excruciating age to be. I started getting quite bad skin, and it was all here. It was awful, that, because you know now as an adult, nobody really cares what you look like and nobody's that bothered, really. You can walk and you become invisible and it's all fine. And I wish sometimes I could go back to my 14-year-old self and says, look, kid, no one's looking at you. It's fine. The whole world isn't looking at that one spot. But along with spots and teenage angst, for some, those years were a time to focus on the future. I think you're following the legal career with a view to ending in Parliament. My thoughts haven't really changed differently. Though, so they definitely wouldn't like to be a coach driver now. When I was 14, I came off a training track, and my father looked at me and he said, right, he said, I, I wanted to find the right moment to say this to you, but I want you to start getting used to the fact you're going to go to the Olympic Games. When I was 14, I was at my British public school, wonderful school in the West Country, really going Great guns. I think I really take my own levels when I was when I was 14. That is me at All Hallows Roman Catholic High School in Pemberton playing Joseph in Joseph in the Amazing Technical Dreamcoat. That was my first lead. But I loved it. It's when I realised that so did the girls. The girls loved me because I was Joseph. I thought, aye aye, something going on here. So that was quite nice. And I still wear that coat down to the precinct. No, I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> a few years later, John's theatrical ambitions saw him leave his Preston home to start a drama degree in Manchester. I was 18. I was the second youngest in my year at drama school, so I was, I was very young. On his first day, he made an extraordinary discovery about his early childhood. My dad drove me in and he said, do you know what that is? And I went, no. And he went, that's where you came from. And I went, what? Really? I had no idea that my drama school was next door to this. This is my humble beginnings, this. This is the Catholic Rescue Society where I was adopted from in 69. I arrived here as a little baby and was rescued by the nuns and then adopted by my mum and dad. I feel grateful, really, to have been looked after and, and put in a decent family, really, so huge gratitude. You know, a good sense of that. In 
In 14 Up, the cheeky seven-year-old from the East End, who we'd all fallen in love with, had a strong sense of what he wanted to achieve in life. The biggest character for me was Tony and that line, I want to be a jockey when I grow up. I want to be a jockey when I grow up. Yeah, I want to be a jockey when I grow up. And he could never keep still. He was always going, going, going. And watching Tony, age 14, grooming the horse, he was taking that very seriously. In his mind, he was going to achieve this dream. He spends all his free time at Tommy Gosling's racing stables at Epsom. And for one shining moment in his teens, Tony's dream came true. This is a photo finish um, when I rode at Newbury. I'm the one with the white cap. I was beating the length and half a third and I had a photo finish. Well, he had a goal, didn't he? It would be more poignant if he never had a goal. He knows what it's like to have been out there. My greatest fulfillment in life, when I, when I rode at Kempton, in the same race as Lester Piggott, I was a naive, wet behind a year's apprentice. All my years from seven, all my ambition is fulfilled in one moment. And I eventually finished last, tailed off, obviously, but it didn't make any difference to me. Just to be part of it, be with a man himself. Couldn't buy it. That was the proudest day of my whole life. He had decided at pretty much the age that I had sort of figured out that I wanted to be an athlete. I had dreams of going to an Olympic Games. Tony's dream was to, you know, be the next Lester Piggott. It worked out for me, it didn't work out for him. And I was actually, in watching that, I was wondering what would I have done had that not been the case? Where would my life have taken me? I don't kid myself. I know that having been successful in sport, it opened doors that were suddenly closed to Tony when he didn't make the grade. But it wasn't only Tony and Seb who dreamt of a sporting career. My chance to go to take football into becoming a career came at about 12, and it didn't happen because um, it would have meant moving to London when I was 12, and my mum and dad were like, well, you can't do that, and we're not going to move to London, so that's not going to happen because um, Arsenal had sort of been interested in me. I didn't know at the time that I had had this offer. Um, my parents knew, and I overheard my parents telling friends of theirs. I was behind the door, and I was very sneakily listening to what was going on, and I heard what had happened, and I was both elated, because it was everything I wanted at that time, and horrified, you know, that it wasn't going to happen. I sympathise a lot with Tony in that when I was 12, 13, 14, I was in the very first version of the stage musical of Oliver. I was just playing one of the boys, but after about three or four weeks, quarter of an hour to go before the show started, they asked me if I would go on as the Artful Dodger. So this is me as the Artful Dodger. That's my Tony moment, isn't it? Like him with Lester Piggott, it was me going on and singing Consider Yourself. The loveliest thing about that day wasn't about me, it was about my dad. My dad was working at County Hall, Westminster, just on the other side of the River Thames. I phoned him as soon as I'd been told that I was going to go on as the Artful Dodger. He just dropped his pen, sped across Westminster Bridge, up towards Trafalgar Square, turned right into St Martin's Lane to what was then the new theatre, raced up to the gallery, paid his tanner, and was there just in time to see me go on and sing Consider Yourself. So my great moment was actually his great moment. Coming up, the Seven Up kids and their celebrity fans on reaching adulthood. You want to tell that boy, don't worry, you get very attractive, Nick. If I saw that version of myself, I would run up to him and punch him in the face. It was 1977 when the up cameras rolled a third time for 21 up. Britain was celebrating the Queen's Silver Jubilee, mourning the death of the King of Rock and Roll, and cheering Red Rum to victory in the Grand National. And this time we saw the Up series changing tack. We brought them all together to watch the films because this year they are 21. What are they doing now? How have they changed? 
What sort of people are they? As something that started off as very much consciously a political exploration about class. I think around 21 up, it had stopped being political and become much more personal instead. No, the way we talk, I don't think we change that much. Well, you never lose an East End accent, will you? I'll tell you what, as it goes, you've definitely changed. You think no? so, yeah. In yeah. facial. You haven't changed, it's definitely. <laughs> don't you think so? I thought I got bigger. You might be an inch big. An inch? <laughs> In 21 Up, the seven-year gap between filming saw the biggest changes of all, as the eye contact avoiding teens had now become young adults. 14 to 21, hugely important. Susie, in her rebellious, chain-smoking, <laughs> fully identified with that version of an early 20s sort of angry girl. What is your attitude towards marriage for yourself? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I haven't given it a lot of thought because I'm very, very cynical about it. So, I was rooting for her. Did you meet enough men before you decided who to marry? Wow! I've been married a year and a couple of months. Um, you do think, Christ, what have I done? <laughs> Neil was brought up in a Liverpool suburb, went to comprehensive school, and dropped out of Aberdeen University after one term. At 21, he was working as a casual labourer on a building site in London. He was the one I worried about most each time. I used to, when the show came on, I thought, oh, I wonder what has happened to that poor fellow who doesn't seem to be able to connect with anybody or anything. For Nick, the science-loving farmer's son, the change over seven years from perky primary school kid... I like a holiday in the town. ..to gawky teenager... No, I've been to Leeds a couple of times. ..had been huge. But that journey from 7 to 14 was nothing compared with the transformation from adolescent to adult. Do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> I don't want to answer that. Yes. I don't want to answer those kind of questions. <laughs> Quite right, son. When I was doing the other one, somebody said, what do you think about girls? And I said, I don't answer questions like that. Is that the reason you're asking it? Yeah, I thought so. Um, you see him being a bit awkward at 14 and is sort of embarrassed and, and just uncomfortable in his own skin. Well, you seemed at 14 very shy of the whole sexual life. Has that changed? I tried to make a change, yes. And then this gorgeous man at 21 who's sort of self-assured and, and confident and couldn't believe it was the same person. Bless him. He got hot. You want to tell that boy who can't even look at the camera, like, don't worry. Don't worry. You get very attractive, Nick. <laughs> By the age of 21, the lives of our famous fans of the series were also moving in many unexpected directions. Probably off me face in Hacienda, I imagine. No, it wasn't. By the age of 20, I was married with three kids. And then suddenly it's family life. And that focus on family life. Well, all of that time, I was constantly looking for excitement and adventure. Got up to all sorts of things. A real rebel, in and out of trouble like you wouldn't believe. When I was 21, I was in a desert outside Isfahan in Persia, Iran, riding a motorcycle to China. Between 14 and 21, huge jump. You know, I just started wheelchair racing. I went to university. I was at Loughborough. Pretty good place to go if you like sport. Graduated at 21 and broke my first world record. That was probably the most important seven years in my entire life in sport because I went from nowhere to becoming one of the best in the world. I think this is when I'm about 21, 21, 22. And that's when I was like thinking, okay, I want my career, I want a husband and I want a baby. And that's what I did. So I kind of worked hard, met my first husband, which is Gary Kemp and got, got pregnant with Finley, so that happened in my early 20s. I think I look about 14, but I'm 21. I recently saw an interview of myself from 20, around 21. I got my first job, and a local news station from Wales came down to London to interview me. Well, the play is called When She Danced, and it's set in Paris in 1923, and it's set in the house of Isadora Duncan. If I saw that version of myself, I would run up to him and punch him in the face. I, I mean, just horrendous. Who was the woman who revolutionised the whole of modern dance, really, I suppose? On the basis of that, I'm very glad I never did anything like this, <laughs> because, oh, boy. Well, my mother and father always used to say, um, 
they always used to wonder where they'd have to come to see me in my first show, you know, that it would be somewhere in some church hall somewhere, <laughs> miles and miles away. So I'm glad I haven't had to do it, but I'm very glad they did. During the 80s and 90s, we saw the kids we'd first met as seven-year-olds in the 60s finding love, starting families, beginning careers, all the usual things that people do, except with cameras arriving every seven years to film them. EastEnder Jackie had married early. Go through there, that's the nursery. <laughs> Got any plans? Oh, do me a favour. She has decided not to have any children. Basically, I would say because I'm far too selfish. I enjoy doing what I want, when I want and how I want. And uh, certainly at the moment, I can't see any way around that. Jackie feels as though her decision to not have children is fueled by a selfishness. I certainly didn't think of myself as being selfish for, for, for not having children. But a lot can change in seven years. And oh, no. this one on. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Had a yeah. brief but very <laughs> sweet relationship, the result of which was Charlie. Cool, blonde. Charlie, you're supposed to clean your teeth. Me and my mum had a couch like that. That's the best thing that could have happened to me. Right, Charlie, there's yours. Oh, please eat it all up. This is such a clever shot, isn't it? You think at the start of the shot that she's still only got the one kid. And then still on the same shot, she brings the porridge in and there's two of them. And last but not least. And she comes out, God blimey, guess what? There's three. Gonna eat that one for me? Lovely piece of storytelling. Finished. <laughs> So what was the experience of becoming a parent like for the famous fans of the show? To be a parent, you have to suddenly be an adult, you have suddenly to be grown up. And I think that was the scariest thing for me, that as soon as I had children, you know, I thought, well, I now definitely have to be grown up. But am I grown up? I remember ringing my mum and saying, I'm pregnant. And she was like, oh, my God, oh, my... And I was like, no, it's OK, you know, it's my impairment's not going to, you know, affect it at all, you know, it's, it's going to be... Okay. And she went, but you don't like children! I'm like, well, hopefully I like this one. I do. The day I had my son was the happiest day of my life, bar none. And I remember that moment where they, uh, they popped him onto my, onto my chest and I looked at his little hairy shoulders and he looked like a little monkey and he was screaming and I just thought he was the most beautiful little thing in the world. Parenting. Well, I'm sure parenting is very important. You can probably get a an MA in parenting for you nowadays. You, I bet you some of these London universities offer MAs in parenting or parenting skills or something like that. I actually can't remember anything about bringing my children up as such. I didn't think of this whole business of bringing children up. You didn't concentrate on it. It wasn't part of the things, you know, which I thought you had to do. Perhaps the most heartwarming parenthood story of all is Simon's. This is the most amazing story of survival. They say, where's your father then? And I just tell him I ain't got one. After his dad left, his childhood was spent in a children's home. Some people just have something really, really special in them. They have a lot of love to give, and you can really sense that from Simon. Since 21, I've got married, had a couple of kids. And, um... By 28, he had married Yvonne, and they had five children. When you saw him at 28 up with five children, I was a bit like, whoa, <laughs> that's going for it, son. They've got everything. They've even got what I never had. So, Which is what? A father, isn't it? His first marriage ended for whatever reason. At 42, he married Vianetta. He still went back for more. He never gave up. It's a real success story for someone who grew up without a father. And that's fathered on to being a foster parent. Went to boarding school when I was young, and I always felt that that was regimental. They didn't allow for personal care, for loving from the adult carers. So I wanted to do something like that for myself, you know, in my own home. What he's been through and what he's come out as and given back as well is just astonishing. 
It's something that all children want, is, is to be loved, is to be wanted. So if you can give that to them, then everything else is second. Because you're multiplying before, so now you're dividing. I once tried to count, and I got up to 65, and I stopped. In a way, he's been able to fill the void that was in his life when he was a little child by doing something about it in spades. <laughs> Across six decades, the UP series hasn't just documented life's highs. The programmes have also reflected the tougher moments that we all have to face. What happens to all of them, certainly in my experience, you can identify with things that have happened in your own life that nobody is immune to. The whips and lashes of what life deals out. It was it February the 9th, exactly 10 minutes past nine. And she just died when we held in the land. Wow. And it was the worst moment of my life. She was, and still is, the best girl in the world. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I really struggle watching things like that. And that's very real. I just love that. So it's hard to watch. <laughs> There's no histrionic about it at all. It's just down the line. No one escapes this. This is a part of life. This is life. This is the conditions it comes with. But then although she's not with, with us in body, she's still with us in spirit. She was a great friend to me as well as a mum. Probably the best friend I'll ever have. It's not that you've lost a mother or a father. You actually just feel you've lost a friend. And still, occasionally, I still find myself thinking, oh, I'll just pick up the phone and talk to them about the day I've had. And you think, oh, no, actually, I can't do that. My mum missed me being made a dame. She would have loved that. She would have got a really big hat for Buckingham Palace. She, she, she would have... Uh, been so proud. Um, Dad was there. Dad saw me go into the House of Lords, and he died soon after. And um, I remember when I found out I was going there, and all he said to me was, um, yep, expected nothing less. That was it. And as you see, it still makes me very emotional now. It's only two years. To some, it probably seems, oh, it's a long time. No. It's not very long. Yes, I don't know how you were with the loss of your parents. My father was 84, and I was holding his hand. And twice I've seen this in someone who's dying, a look of absolute joy in his eyes. Jeez. Up, He looked at me with open, childlike eyes. He looked at my sister, and I could see nothing but happiness. And he went literally two hours later. My mother died quite young. She lived an extraordinary life. And losing her was very, very hard. This was 20 years ago, and I still miss her terribly. Of course you do, and that's, that's understandable. Ruler's parents were Polish aristocrats who fled to England after the Second World War. And when she was younger, they used to bring her here, to the Hearth Club, a focal point for London's Polish community. Every time I walk through these doors, I am... Um showered with memories of my parents and all the relatives who are no longer with us. And it still just reminds me of all the wonderful things that happened here, dancing the polonaise with my father, Chopin concerts, drinking the best vodka in the world. I mean, you name it, absolutely everything. Every time I come here, it doesn't take a lot to make me cry, but um, I do become emotional. I loved my mother beyond belief. She was an extraordinary woman. Very warm, loving, caring, adoring, magnificent mother. She was in concentration camp for two and a half years, and she rescued her own mother from the gas chambers. Deeply religious, and had no fear of dying, fear, obviously, of pain and suffering and sadness at leaving us behind. 
I think about her every single day. There was one Seven Up subject, though, whose life journey no one could have predicted. The rocking back and forth, you're thinking, this story is not going to end well. He, for me, shows what it is to be human. For over half a century, the Up series has reflected the twists and turns of life that we all face, but which the cast could never have foreseen at the age of seven. And that's especially true of the boy we first met as he happily skipped through the Liverpool suburbs. We pretend we've got swords, and uh, we make the noise of the swords fighting, and uh, once we really stab us, we go, ah! The journey with Neil is an extraordinary journey. He struggles with life, as we all do, but the struggle is so on the surface with him. He's so engaged with that struggle. And yet, as a child, he has such life and joy about him. He's possibly the most joyful of all those children. At 21, he was working on a building site and living in a squat. It could be a bit warmer, it's a bit chilly, but um, it's perfectly satisfactory for the time being. He, for me, shows what it is to be human, what it is to struggle through a life, to go through all those ups and downs and those extremes. At 28, Neil was roaming around Britain. We found him on the west coast of Scotland. If the money runs out, well, then for a few days, there's nowhere to go to. And that's just, that's all you can do. I simply have to find the, the warmest shed I can find. You see him living in that little caravan. Look at that background. I mean, it's just absolutely raw with him. Do you worry about your sanity? <laughs> um... Other people sometimes worry about it. Like who? The rocking back and forth, you're thinking, oh, God, this story is not going to end well. Uh, as I said, I, I sometimes can be found behaving in, 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 in an erratic fashion. Um, I sometimes get very frustrated, very angry, for, for no apparent reason, for a reason which, which won't be apparent to other people around me. He's in a lot of physical pain because of... of how he's feeling mentally. At 35, he's living in a council flat in the Shetland Islands. And what would you like to be doing, say, in seven years? I can think of all kinds of things I'd like to be doing. The real question is, what, what am I likely to be doing? But you've got this guy who looks like a poverty-stricken Russian poet in the 19th century, with this great coat which seems like his only comfort in life. I tend to think the most likely answer is that I'll be wandering homeless around the streets of London. But um, with a bit of luck, that would happen. And then you cut seven years later. For a second, you can't tell because he's got a scarf on and a big coat and a sort of ramshackle pork pie hat if he's homeless or not. <laughs> First of all, they are geographically isolated. They're separated from most of Hackney by... And suddenly, he's a councillor, and he's a perfect councillor. Yes, he, because he's been through it he's all. He's been through it all. Really he knows what it's all about. He's a kind man, he's a thoughtful man. I think he's a beautiful man. The question of long-term sick leave delegation... If he was my local councillor, you know, he'd think, yeah, I've got faith in this guy because he's seen all walks of life himself firsthand. Neil's extraordinary life journey continues to surprise us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Seven years ago, he was a lay minister in Cumbria. His journey is crazier than, than anybody else's on this. He is always the one that just resonates the most for me. He has, in some ways, had the fullest life, I think. When we last saw Neil and the rest of the Seven Up kids in 2012, they were 56. The older they get, it becomes more and more moving. What life has dealt to these people. Seven more years have passed. So what are the lives of those seven-year-olds like at 63? I think it's more intimate than the others have been. 
I think it's funnier than the others have been, and I think it's more revelatory than the others have been. I just think it's more rounded and emotional than it's ever been before. I can't wait to see the next chapter, because I've followed it. You know, I've grown up with them. Much more than just the story that you're following. I mean, it really means something to me now, because I identify so much with these people. Health, no doubt, will be a big part of it. Sadly, as you get older, it's a roll of the dice, as they say. I don't know which stories I'm going to be most intrigued by, because I don't know what's going to happen to them. I hope they know what they're achieving by doing it, and that's to show us ourselves. It's like a mirror. The amazing thing about this series is we don't know what way it'll turn out. Same as our own lives. Who knows what's ahead? Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. In 1963, World in Action made a film about these seven-year-old children. They talked about their homes, their schools, and what they wanted to be. The current affairs with the BBC was very kind of straightforward, like reading the Times and all this sort of stuff. And gradually, Granada sort of simply turned that over through that whole attitude about current affairs, that it was elitist and government-sponsored. And one of the main uh, parties involved in this was an Australian called Tim Hewitt, who at 28 had become the editor of the Daily Express, which is kind of remarkable. And Sidney Bernstein took him in, took him into the company to really look after the whole current affairs. And he just changed the whole thing around. He revolutionized it. He put the Daily Mirror, he put tabloid news onto television, but not in a kind of sleazy way, just in a very urgent, direct way. Very political, very accessible and important stuff. And he really, it was like a great fart across British television. Suddenly here was this new energy. And he established World in Action, uh, which had established a year or so before 1963 and had already set itself up as a weekly current affairs program full of energy and daring subjects, traveling, going to other parts of the world to do stuff, dealing with social issues as well as political issues. And out of that, he had this idea that he wanted to have a look at Great Britain in the 60s, the early 60s. This was the age of the Beatles, the age of when you know, London was the center of the world for 15 minutes, and as was Liverpool to an extent. And he, he had this idea of let's have a look to see how English society is changing. Is it changing? Is all this stuff cosmetic or, cosmetic or is this the real thing? And really out of that came Seven Up. World in Action enters the struggling, changing world of the seven-year-old. Uh, he had this idea, let's take a whole gang of seven-year-olds in, let's put them in, let's shoot it in a square, put the camera on a high building, have them, say, 20 of them out in the square, say, those that are going to be successful, step forward. And, you know, you'd step forward seven people and say these people would make it and the rest of them wouldn't. And then by that you'd then start to analyze the class system. You know, was it because of their class they came from, they weren't going to be successful or etc. And so out of that idea came Seven Up. We, Paul Armand was the original director, he was a Canadian. Myself and Gordon McDougall were the researchers and in three weeks we had to get all the kids together and, you know, choose them and shoot it, shoot it very quickly. But, uh, and between Paul and me and Gordon, we kind of sort of took the rough edges off the idea and made it, kept the kind of the power of the thing, but gave it more of a kind of filmic and rather more delicate quality. And of course it was very successful. It was only ever going to be one film. These children are now 14, halfway between childhood and manhood. This is our interim report. 
I remember, you know, I was chugging along on Coronation Street and finished that, and I was doing dramas, and I was sat in the commissary at, at Granada in the canteen, and Dennis Foreman, who was the head of programs, came up and sat next to me, said, what do you think about us going back to seeing how these uppers with seven-up kids are doing? I thought, oh, well, that's, that's a good idea. And, and I mean, and this was about five years after the era. He said, let's, let's go back, you know, to a, to a seven-yearly look at it. And, you know, there's a promise contained in the first one. You know, there's a promise, turn on, you know, turn on to Granada Television in the year 2000 and see what's happened to them. So it was a kind of vague, implicit promise, although not serious, more of a kind of cheesy tag than anything else to, to follow these people. But it really never occurred to us until Dennis sat me down and said, why don't we go do it? So I said, oh, okay. And so we did, you know, and it was a tough one. I mean, it was, they're not the easiest things to interview, you know, British teenagers with spots and, and things like that. And it was all monosyllabic and painful and all that. But, you know, when we put it together, you could see the beginnings of a terrific idea, of a powerful idea. But it's embarrassing to me how long it took us to really figure it out. Once we'd done 7 plus 7, then, you know, then really my great you know, my great responsibility really was to hang in on it. They were filmed again when they were 14. We brought them all together to watch the films because this year they are 21. I mean, my career took me all over the world, but I kept hanging in on this. And, you know, you know, although they never thought I'd keep doing it once I moved to America, you know, my idea was that this was something really precious. and. I saw immediately then the value of it once I'd done the second one and then kept it going, which was my, I think, contribution to it, not much else, but just to keep the thing together, keep it going, keep in touch. One of the, really, the features of doing this up film, I mean, is it's not a comfortable thing necessarily for all the participants to do. And so we wanted to build some continuity into it, you know, not just continuity of them, but continuity of the people who were part of the production team. You know, I started out with Margaret Bottomley is my right hand, and she did 7 and 14 and 21. Well, she did 14 and 21. And then she died, and then Claire joined me. Claire joined me at 28, Claire Lewis, and she's been with me all the time. But, you know, George, Jesse Turner has shot it since 21. Kim Horton has cut it since 28. Nick Steer has done all the sound since 28. So we're a family, you know, and I think it gives, it's kind of reassuring for them to know. They always say, is George doing it? Is Nick there? And you say, of course, of course. And Jackie does the kind of the paperwork on that's George's wife. And so I think that helps a lot with it all. We keep in touch with them. You know, Claire keeps in touch with them all the time, not in an invasive way, but, you know, just to see how things are going. And they're very good at, you know, letting us know what's going on. But you know, I'm going to do this in 2000, and I have to deliver this. I always work backwards. They'll want it for, like, May or September through 2012, Olympic year. And so then we work backwards. I like to shoot it as near to that as possible. So I, I will probably shoot around, start shooting in the new year, and then work from the new year to, and deliver it in April or May. So probably in the autumn or late summer of, of 11, and then we'll start ringing them up and finding out what's going on. You know, now, um, I will have seen some of them during the course of the seven years. So, you know, like, for example, if I ever get to make the Narnia film and it's, you know, it's premiered in London, I'll either have a special screening for them and their friends and their neighbors. So we sort of know what's going on, but I never spend any time with them about the film. And every time I do it, you know, in, in the nicest possible way, people say, you know, documentaries, techniques change, and people say, well, why don't you put music in it? Or what's, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And yet I, I've always been, I think, smart enough to know of what I have, the power of what I have, which is its simplicity, and, and the power of the interview, and knowing that my main card to play are these faces going through these generations, and that all the, you know, all the, uh, all the theatrics of how documentaries changed over the decades and all that and I've you know although I've used them in my other documentary work with this I've kept it kind of if you want old-fashioned or pure but I've always fought for that and stuck with that and I think it's paid off because you know different people have come in and you know the management's changed it's thank God Granada's still there it's the only reason frankly the film has survived no other reason that they've been there every seven years 
owning the copyright and prepare to finance it. I've, I'm involved in other longitudinal studies, and they're a nightmare. You know, if you lose the if you lose the finance on the first one, not only have you got to finance for the next one, but you've got to get the copyright from the first one. But Granada's kind of belief in it and, and commitment to it is the one reason it's it's kept going. I mean, it's a very odd job doing longitudinal films because you know, you're entirely at the participant's mercy. I mean, when you're doing a documentary film, you can tell fibs and whatever. I mean, you know, you could say to me, oh, I would never use that bit, Michael, and all that, and you're using, what am I gonna do, kill you? I mean, but if, if you just say, use something I don't want you to use, and then you come back to me and say, we're gonna do it again, I shall say, over my dead body. And that's the burden I live with, so I have to behave myself. And I, I mean, anyway, I mean, I don't have to be told that although that is an underlying thing that I do want the show to continue, so I don't want to alienate them or upset them. And, you know, there are, some are very interested in what it is and want to see it before it goes out. Others are entirely trusting of me, and those that want to see it, and they'll give me notes on it, and I'll have to argue them out. And sometimes I'll win and sometimes I'll lose, but, you know, I don't really have a choice if I want to keep going. So it's an odd thing, but... Again, I mean, beyond that, emotionally, I mean, I've known them for over 40 years. I mean, how many people do I have in my life who I've known for over 40 years? Not that many. So, you know, these are very important people to me. And when people say, well, what's it like? I say, well, it is actually like, truly like a family. You know, some of us get on well. I see some a lot of the time, some none of the time. Some don't like me, some do like me, you know. So it is, it is very much like a family, and I suppose it would have to be after all this time. But it's a very curious relationship. It's a very curious form of filmmaking as well, because you, know, you, you can't just have the film in front of you in your mind. You know, you've got to have the whole, the whole thing and how long it's going to go. And you know, the other thing I'm Im immensely grateful for is that no one's died. You know, I haven't lost anybody, and you know, my hope is that I'll go first. I won't have to deal with it. Um, that you know will be a massive uh, challenge if, if if someone does pass away you know during the course of all this while it's still going so but it's it's a very unusual and and when you know when we took hired directors to do them you know we do the the Russian one and the American one you know you have to explain to the director that the producer that it's a lifetime's work you know it's not your whole work. Oh, I mean, not at all, but it is a lifetime's commitment because that's the only way it's going to work. If you and this family of crew that I've talked about, you know, stay with it and, and give it that sense of continuity. And it's always my nightmare, you know, for the once we decide, okay, we're going to get on the phone now, this is it. We're going to say, we're going to do it. This is when we're going to do it. Tell us where you're going to be in January or something. That's my nightmare of how many are going to say, well, I'm sorry, Michael, but we can't do it anymore, you know, and then all this business of trying to persuade them to do it, that's the hardest part for me in the whole thing is, because I don't want to lose them, you know, I mean, I would say to Charles when I was speaking to him, or Peter, you can do anything, you know, I mean, I said to Charles, do your own episode, you, you direct it, because he's a documentary filmmaker, I mean, just be on there, just come on and say hello, you know, anything. Um, but, the, you know, and some of them are great about it, you know, and, and, and very, nurturing about it and very supportive of it. But it's very, very stressful for, for me and Claire thinking how many, if any, we're going to lose any more or because some come and go, John comes and goes, you know, and uh, is he going to come this time or not or whatever or it's something going on in someone's life that we can't, will make them inaccessible. That, that's the tough part because the more I have, the better it is. Again, this business of it's, it's not about individuals. It is and yet it isn't. It's the individuals, but there's a, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's to, it's to have all of them there and to see and to contrast in your mind how they've all changed over the years and all that. That's such an important ingredient of it that any loss is a great loss for me. Give me a child until he is seven and I will give you the man. This has been a glimpse of Britain's future.
my great dream was to be a movie director. I'd seen Ingmar Bergman's Wild Strawberries and fallen in love with that when I was at school in 1957 or something. And that was what I wanted to do. ITV started in 1957. Uh, before that, it was just the BBC. And you know, it was decided to open it up into a competitive and into an advertising marketplace. So the BBC wasn't going to simply monopolize the whole of British television. And so ITV started off and it was given, it was done regionally and Granada won the uh, Northwest, which was sort of Manchester, Liverpool area and the Bernstein family owned Granada Television. Uh, they were the company that had the Northwest. And it sort of got off to a slightly slow start, uh, commercial television, and largely it had to really just get numbers. You know, did, uh, did a lot of variety and quiz shows and all that sort of stuff. But Granada's heart was always elsewhere. You know, Bernstein was a very political animal, uh, very interested, very left-wing. And he sort of, over the first few years, gathered together a very strong political atmosphere uh, in, in, the, in the company. Uh, and really, by 1963, it really, when I joined, it really had set its, set its stall. It really was a powerful company. It wasn't a big company, but it had decided what its specialities were going to be, which was drama, current affairs, documentaries, and to a certain extent, light entertainment and really went after that stuff and, and was frankly the best place to be. And when I went up to Granada, they took, they interviewed hundreds of us and then took about 30 or so up there to interview for a couple of days. And I got the very strong sense that everybody, all the other people up there with me wanted to be drama directors and everybody was competing. And I thought, well, I do have other interests here. And so I decided on really on the spur of the moment to say, no, I want to be do documentaries. And of course, I was the only one, and so I think that's how I got on the course, because it was incredibly competitive. But it was sort of genuine, because I was very interested in really how you could bring politics into drama and documentaries and stuff like that. So whether I, I mean, Granada came out to find us. They sent, I remember Derek Granger out to the universities, and he interviewed us. And I'll never forget meeting him. He had a pink shirt on. It was the first time I'd ever seen a man in a pink shirt. Um, and, uh, you know, we were recruited, so, I mean, the only other game in town really was the BBC. And it was, you know, great good fortune, really, to go to Granada for a number of reasons. One is it was on the up and up. It was the most dynamic place to be. And also it was very, very small. I mean, they couldn't afford a trainer, so, so really we had, it was on-the-job on the training, you know, and we had to do everything. I mean, in my first two or three years at Granada, I did any, if you name it, I did it, whether it was rock and roll with the Beatles or a football match or church services or Coronation Street, I did it. You had to. Had I gone in the BBC, I would have been compartmentalized. I would have gone into a department. I would have been on Panorama or on something like that, and I would, it would have been murder to have left it. So it was incredibly fortuitous for me because it gave me a chance to try everything, to see what I could do and what I couldn't do. Why commercial television in those days was so vital it was because, you know, it was regional. Um, it wasn't just the great metropolis and the metropolis sucking people down there into London to make stuff. You know, these companies, whether it's Granada or eventually Yorkshire or ATV or, you know, in Wales or in the south, they were putting on local voices. And as it happened, the northwest was a very vigorous voice, I mean, a huge centre of population. But... So there was a tremendous pride in Granada giving itself a northern identity. And also, it was part of the deal, too. I mean, when they gave the licenses to these companies, you know, which was kind of a revolution. Here we were giving the whole process of communication, of broadcasting, out to a commercial company. It wasn't in the hands of the BBC and Lord Reith and all that. This was you know, a major revolution in some ways. There was a tremendous pride, and so when it said, from the north, you know, that really was their calling card, and it was a very vigorous one. The first thing that happened to us was we were, you know, we were assigned tutors, since so we'd feel at home, you know, coming from Oxbridge, and mine was Parky, it was Parkinson, and, and <laughs> I, I was sent up to meet him, I knocked on the door, and there's a, like that, and he looked at me and said, are you the fucking trainee? I thought, well, this is a bit far from the dreaming spires of Cambridge or whatever, but you know, he and I became 
lifelong friends, but it was, it was kind of curious. I mean, it wasn't training in any sense that the BBC was training, you know, it wasn't. It was much more being around and sort of, you know, getting what you could get out of it. I mean, for example, the Bernstein sent us to a Granada cinema, I was sent to Mansfield, <laughs> just to see, you know, how things happened in the cinemas and all this sort of stuff, you know. And then they sent us to Blackpool, um, just sort of gave us a little bit of money and sent us up there, put us, had someone sort of from up there look after us. But, you know, we had to look at Blackpool. You know, here there's the centre of working class entertainment in, in, in the north of England and one of the centres. And so, you know, they wanted to expose us to that. So it was, they didn't really have the time or the money to, to train us in it since they just kind of chucked us in. And then when we'd done our six months, I was put on World in Action with Gordon to do 7-Up. That was my first job. And then, you know, I was on World in Action for a bit, and that was terrifying. Live television was still very much around, at, seen at 6.30, and uh, one was full of dramas. And I, I, I mean, I also, one of my first assignments was to direct the news, not the news at 10, but I mean local news. And I'll never forget, you know, I, there was this interview that I had to do, and I forgot to put the sound man there. So this interview went out and there was no, you couldn't hear it. I mean, it was full of disasters like that. I mean, and people were incredibly patient because as I said, it was on the job training. I mean, I was slung onto the news pretty early on after I'd done my sort of time as a researcher on World in Action. And I mean, I hadn't a clue what I was doing. And, and, and people were very, very helpful, but it's, it's a kind of miracle what people put up with. And then, but then when I went on to Coronation Street, it wasn't exactly live, but you couldn't edit it. I mean, you had to go through it in one go. And that, you know, that, I mean, you learned all these things. I don't know whether in the end they were worth learning, but you really had to learn how to do a whole, you know, 15 minutes of Coronation Street in one take, pretty much. You know, so again, there was all these, and then, I mean, I remember, you know, other things. I mean, I had to do party political conferences, and that was, kind of weird because you had to do two, sometimes three things simultaneously. I mean, you were, you know, you were doing a national feed and then you were doing feeds to local places with their own MPs on and stuff like that. So you were actually sat there directing two things at once. You know, you had a lot of cameras on a convention, even in those days, six or seven. So you had to direct those cameras there going out live. And then over here, you were doing an interview with a three camera interview that was being broadcast live somewhere else. So. I mean, it, it was it was mind-boggling, you know. And God knows how we got through it, but you know, it's, I mean, on the other hand, you just think, well, maybe this isn't a proper life, you know, this live television stuff. <laughs> this isn't this isn't quite what I want to be doing. And, and and again, you know, I mean, I you know, you do music stuff, and you think I'm really not very good at this, you know. So time to move on. <laughs> doing Seven Up and and doing World in Action, I, I sort of knew what I wanted to do. I, I did not want to do journalism. I mean, I was no good at banging on people's doors. You know, I mean, I'll never forget uh, when I was pretty young, I just started, you know, I was put on, they were doing a special film about the Moors murders. Oh my God, you know, and we, we were given complete access by the police because they didn't know what they were in for, they didn't know what they were up to. And so we were up there, you know, and they were digging up the gardens and digging up these kids' bodies and all that. And then suddenly they realized this was a major event and you know, shut us down and everything. And we never broadcast the film, it was so awful. I'll never forget being with Barry Cockcroft, who was a researcher, and we were trying to get people to talk to us. And he was there, had this money, and he would be putting 10 pound bills or whatever through people's doors to get them to speak. And I thought, oh my God, I can't deal with this. So I mean, I, I, I knew that Seven Up taught me that I wanted to do documentary films that I didn't want to do. I was no good at doing foot in the door journalism. You know, I was not a newspaper man. That was not my, you know, I was an Ingmar Bergman lover. <laughs> I was not a newspaper man. You know, I'd always hankered after doing movies and drama and whatever. And, and Newell and I were very close. And Newell, after I'd been up there, I suppose, three or four, no, two or three years, that was all. Newell was doing Coronation Street and he went on holiday. And so I went up to the management and said, can I do Newell's holiday relief on Coronation Street? And they sort of said, why not?
Well, I mean, the Coronation Street was fantastic training. I mean, just fantastic because, you know, it was the biggest show on television. So the people in it were the biggest stars in Britain. They, uh, have they got the lad out yet? No, not yet. I'm not going to move him till the doctor's done a quick check. You know, a, a lot of them were, were really terrific actors. So it was great experience. And of course, the thing was, is that you could not actually mess it up. You couldn't screw it up because it ran itself. I mean, I'd been, I came in on the, in 1966, I think, 65. They'd been running for five years then. And they all, everybody knew what they were doing, you know, and you couldn't screw it up. So that was, I mean, you didn't really realize that. But on the other hand, you sort of knew it would not grind to a halt and you'd be off the air. You know, it wasn't, <clears throat> and the people in it were very, very nice, you know, um, and they really sort of looked after you. If you didn't go in and be, pretend you were Stanley Kubrick, you know, if you went in in a modest way. But the experience, I mean, again, you had to work with scripts, you had to, you had to rehearse them, you had to do a lot of work quickly, and you, could, you knew you could make mistakes, not that you would wish it upon yourself, but you knew it wasn't life or death, you know, when you went out into the freelance market, when you went doing freelance work, whatever it was, you knew that, you know, you couldn't screw up. I mean, these things would stay with you. So it was, it was hard work, it was difficult work, but it was very diverse work. And you met a whole different group of actors, and as I said, of all sorts of shapes and sizes and different talents and different abilities. And to do that and to do it you know, every week, I mean, you were on a three-week turnaround, you know, to do it for months and months and months was a fantastic experience. Big Breadwinner Hogg was, uh, was another kind of uh, Dennis Foreman um, adventure in a sense. You know, it was uh, Robin Chapman wrote it and Mike Newell was the, the main director on it and I, he did six episodes, I did two, and that rewrote the laws of kind of violence on television. Oh, God. Oh. Right, now the rest of it, or oh, there'll be no doctor. The gristle of it. Sally! I mean, you know, we were living through the, through the period of the Richardsons and the Crays and all sorts of dreadful kind of gang warfare, and none of that was ever really ever represented on, on television. And there was all hell broke loose when this stuff came on, you know, because it was pretty violent. I mean, <clears throat> you know, people having acid thrown all of them, and all of a sudden the language and just the violence. So, you know, it was, it was very, very controversial. It was kind of exciting and fun to be in the middle of it. I was somewhat the lesser of the two directors in it, but to work with another director, and he was, as I said, one of my closest friends anyway, and, you know, and still is. And, you know, to see Dennis have to fight the other companies, you know, and to have to fight Parliament to have it on, I mean, it was, it was an absolute scandal. And, I mean, and it got on very late at night. And, of course, looking back on it now, it's just ridiculous, you know. Um, but nonetheless, it was exciting to do, um, you know, to, to, to have to handle that kind of treatment, knowing that material, that violent material, and that language, you know, knowing that, you know, your mother wouldn't dare go out of the house and all that sort of stuff, that it was bringing a lot of bad news to, to, you know, to the apt-head name or whatever, but it was, it was really interesting doing very, very well written and very well done. It was interesting, Parker's Patch, because, uh, you know, I sort of cut the umbilical cord, and, and the first place I went was, was to Yorkshire Television, and I did two shows there, Follyfoot, about a horse, and then Parkins Patch, which was a kind of regional cock show. But I mean, I just, again, they're very important in my lives because it was a big thing for me to do. You know, I mean, I was still young, I was still in my 20s, and, you know, to actually take a big step into the freelance market and not to have all the comfort zone of Granada around you and all your mates and everybody you had kind of grown up with, you know, who knew who you were, to go out into the world. And, you know, it was a kind of di different atmosphere at Yorkshire too. It was more commercial. It wasn't quite so, you know, hard-assed and whatever as Granada. So, you know, those two things um, were, those two series and, and, and uh, Parkins Patch were very, <laughs> and, you know, I, I had lived in Leeds and all that. So it was my first really baby steps, you know, out of Granada, out of Manchester. Well, I made a lot of relationships uh, when I was at Granada in those early days uh, because as it was a small company, we were all sort of doing the same thing. And on scene at 6.30, which was uh, the kind of regional news program, uh, which would have magazine items in it, which need writing. I remember Arthur Hopcraft was on that and he was a Guardian journalist and he was to become a major television writer. 
and uh, I did a lot of his stuff. And then I met Jack Rosenthal when I went on to do my Mule's Holiday Relief on Coronation Street, and he was one of the writers on it. And he and I got on very well. I did uh, with the lovers, so that was part of my relationship with Jack. Uh, I really began to do pretty much everything he did. I, did don't, I didn't do the evacuees in the BBC did, which won um, a BAFTA for Michael Tutler, but I did pretty much everything else of his. And, you know, we used to work so well together that, uh, you know, it was interesting to do different genres with him. You know, I started with him on the street. And then, you know, I think we then probably went into one-off plays. Um, you know, uh, <coughs> Your Name's Not God, It's Edgar, and the football won another Sunday, and whatever, and there were a few of them. And, I, and then he had the idea to do a series, you know, with, with Richard Beckinsale and Paula Wilcox. And so I did the series. Uh, when that was live in front of an audience, and it wasn't broadcast, I was shot live in front of an audience. 409 days ago, what might have been? If you hadn't been so flaming passionate. Jeffers, <laughs> would you? Making indecent suggestions, interfering with me garments. Are you sure you're not confusing me with some other Zulu? 409 days ago, you used to invite me in for a bit. <laughs> so, again, that was just part of the fact that we got each other. You know, it's just wonderful working with someone which you're exactly on the same day we went through. You know, that he wouldn't have to tell me very much, I wouldn't have to tell him very much, but if I had something to say about the script, he would listen to it, and if he had something to say about what I was doing, and it was a totally amicable, friendly thing. I mean, it was, uh, so I had a very close relationship with him as I did with, with Hopcraft too. And so I pretty much did everything he wrote, you know, which was, and by that time, you know, I had left Granada and I was sort of freelancing around, but I mean, the bonds were so strong between us. That, uh, and, and I love writers. And, and so when you do get a really close relationship with a writer, it's, it's a very kind of thing to cherish, you know. Doing the Laurence Olivier Presents was very, very daunting. I mean, it was a family affair because David Plowright, who was another great influence on me, was running the company. He had taken over from Dennis Foreman. His sister, Joan Plowright, was Lord Olivier's wife. And so Olivier, who had been quite sick for a long time, decided he wanted to reconnect with the audience, and so he agreed to do six plays. And he was going to star in most of them and direct some of them. And the first play was Harold Prince's The Collection, which had existed originally as a television play at Rediffusion. And then had been, he'd rewritten it and into a stage play and had been done. And now he was doing it again as a television play. So it had gone a kind of circle. And this was the first of the series of fil films. As far as, so, so it was incredibly daunting to know that you were going to direct Sir Laurence Olivier. I mean, ridiculous. And you expect it. If you were lucky, you'd stay on it, and you know. <clears throat> but anyway, I mean, what was sort of somewhat stressful for me was the fact that he also wanted to learn how to direct because he was going to direct stuff. So not only was he acting in it, but he was on my shoulder watching me do it and expecting me to teach him how to be a television director. So that was ridiculously kind of, you know, it was. I'll never forget just you know going to the read through because I had this breathtaking cast. I had. Sir Laurence Olivier, I had uh, Alan Bates, Malcolm McDowell, and Helen Mirren. You know, and there was Harold Pinter, and there was Derek Granger, and there's me. Anyway, so we, you know, it was a pretty alarming experience, but he was, was great. I mean, he, he, was, he did let me direct him. I mean, I must say, I would have been happy, and would, it wouldn't have been unexpected if he just told me to shut up and point the cameras, you know, get on, and let them do it. But they were, it was, uh, in fact, an incredible experience. I mean, they really did let me in on it. I did feel, you know, that, uh, and we would argue about stuff, you know, me and the Lord Olivia arguing, it was unimaginable. But it was, it was, you know, a really great experience. And Pinter too, I mean, all these kind of legends, it was, 
you know, just even thinking about it makes you kind of. But no, it was it was a terrific time. What could have been horrible, it was a terrific time. You know, I think the sixties and seventies was, was truly a golden time. I mean, the, you know, the be the British, the best work in British film was being done on television. The best directors were working on television. Um, it was the best work. Um, every part of it, it couldn't last, you know, it didn't last, but it was a real true golden age in every genre, you know, in, in comedy, in light entertainment, variety, drama, documentary, everything, it really was. And there was, I think, what it was, was it was really before the bottom line took over, you know, before things got very, started getting very, very expensive, people started getting greedy and all that, there was a a true kind of energy and innocence about it. You know, people wanted to do good work and the, the very best people were in there. The very best people were running the companies. And, you know, the BBC was run by, you know, very kind of radical people who were taking on the establishment and all this time once they'd woken up after ITV had given them a little swift kick up the backside. I mean, just the very best people were there and people were allowed to work creatively and the money was there and there wasn't a lot of you know, censorship or whatever. And you know, as time went on, of course, it got fat and greedy and, and whatever, and value system went up the spout and times changed and, and whatever. But for a period of time, it was truly a golden age, I think.